there's the creative brain and the business brain, and that they don't always communicate. Business of Architecture, episode three twenty two. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that doesn't get in the way of you doing your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's only step-by-step business training program that shows you how to structure your practice so the complexity of running a business doesn't get in the way of you doing your best work. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today, you'll hear from accomplished interior designer, Michelle Lin. I enjoyed this conversation because Michelle isn't just a designer, she's also built a business that suits her life, which you know, this is something that I'm passionate about and that's what basically what we talk about here on the podcast. Michelle also runs an online course teaching other interior designers how to structure their firm for maximum freedom and profit. In this interview, you'll discover how to use processes in your business to free you up. Hello, Michelle, and welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you, Enoch. I am so honored to be here. Super glad to have you. And look, right now, at the time that we're recording this, I I don't want to gloss over this, but let's talk about it. What's happening right now from Riyadh? We're in the middle of the COVID crisis. What are you seeing where you're at over there in Texas? So here in Dallas, it um, we have been sheltered in place for probably I think two or three weeks. My team and I had started winding down a few weeks ago, and most of most of the population is honoring it. Uh, grocery stores, of course, are still still working in place. The uh, pharmacies and so forth. Work itself, from a design, architecture, building renovation, the uh, the uh, projects that have been in process, they're still going on. The renovations and so forth, if it's a home that is occupied, we're not able to get permits to start those. But um, new builds are great. Vacant properties are still being able to have their projects and so forth. And the design process itself, we still have clients calling and just wondering, how can we do this virtually? So um, my team has still has quite a bit of work. So thankfully, their their jobs are all in place and we still have some cash coming in. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. And for, for your design business, because you run a design business, but you also teach designers similar to what I do, which is the business side of, of design. And we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but just regarding your practice that you have right now, where do you find the majority of your leads and your projects come from? Our leads and projects truly come from social media. And I mm. believe that they come organically through there, whether it is from one platform to another to another, and then they finally call us. Uh, we also have it coming through Google. I think the SEO investment that we've made has has paid off nicely. And of course, thankfully, our happy clients do refer some of their friends and family. Mm. And when you say social media, what platform are you are you getting the best response from? I'd say we're getting the best response or the most recent response is coming from Instagram. So whether they go to Pinterest and then that leads us them to our website and then they go to Instagram and follow us for a while and, and see that we are um, legit and, and fun at the same time and that our personalities align, that's when they call. So if we were to go back and run through our, uh, through our data, I think Instagram would continually pop up as how people have found us most recently. And what, how do you post on social media? What's your process for that? So it right now with the environment, the way it is, I'm a little bit more organic prior to this sheltering in place and being a little bit more sensitive, I believe, because I don't want to be shouting from the rooftops, hey, hire me when people just got laid off from their job. Prior to that, I use Planoly, which is a pre-programmed uh, plat- a platform where you can pre-program your posts. Try saying that three times quickly. Um, and I will get on there and you can pre-program your hashtags. And 
I try to do everything from education, entertainment, and um, just a little bit of enlivenment. So it's it's a, a selling point every two to three posts, but I also believe in giving things away. So if I can share business tips or if I can share design tips, I think that that's important for those individuals who may never be a customer or a student or a client. Um, but still, still leaving them with something that we can that we can improve their lives with. And how often do you post content? Oh my gosh, uh, once, twice a day. So um, with my platform that serves the business of interior design, I like to share something that is a little bit more inspirational and just like with the the, the mindset of it and the uh the the details that go into the empowerment as well as business tips or encouraging the uh, the viewer to take a look and go to my website and download something for free so that that oftentimes can be twice a day um but i've also learned that if i don't have anything to say it's, i'm not just don't just post something it, it needs to have some value versus um just posting to post and, and the, so is that the same on the design side of your business that you're posting twice a day? And what are you posting? Are you posting images of projects, interesting t- tips about interior design? Tell me what that looks like. So that's just once a day. Um, that is not necessarily as targeted towards the, the mindset or the encouragement or, or of, of, of somebody trying to begin a business. Um, the design side is more along the lines of here's what we did. Here's why we did it. Or here's a funny story that went with this image or anything along that line. We are featuring our own projects. On occasion, we'll feature another designer's project, just something that inspires us. Um, I also like to share my team. I am very blessed with an amazing team. So it's not just all about me. And I want the audience to see and we joke about it. it's like buy one get two free. So um, just understanding that our personalities all blend together and we we collaborate on on all of our designs. So it's it's nice that you get each of our experience, each of our perspective, each of our point of view, even though you're just assigned to one interior designer, so that you're not getting emails from all of us as a client. It'll be a little overwhelming. Michelle, when you look at the business side of things and structuring a business that empowers a designer to be able to be their best self and do their best work, what do you think, from your perspective, are the most important qualities, things, attributes, strategies, tactics that someone needs to have to really have an empowered business? It's, it's so as the business owner, I believe that you need to have no ego. I think that that is a difficult place to come from because you need to be able to empower your team and let them rise and, and, and hold them up and, and let the spotlight shine on them. I believe that you also get better team when they, when they do get that recognition and when they do get some of the juicy projects and you're not hoarding them all for yourself. I I also think that being able to delegate is, is imperative, but delegation also entails the ability to explain and set your expectations. Because if, if, as a business owner, if you just say, hey, I need you to do this, well, that's great, but they might only do part of this. And I believe it's my responsibility as the business owner to really draw out what those expectations are so that nobody, um, so nobody's disappointed at the end of the day, because if, if, if there's a deadline, especially, and it's not delivered to the expectation needed, then you're either going to have to really whip it into high gear and probably deliver something that's not to the um, standard that you would want as a business owner. Um, but then also reminding yourself that your, your staff doesn't read minds. Kind of like being married. <laughs> my husband doesn't read my mm. mind, so I have to make sure he understands it. <laughs> mm. All right, I have kids too, so I was thinking it's just sort of like having kids. You got to let them know what you expect. We had this issue yesterday with some expectations that weren't met. Right. So, right. all right, so 
De- delegation, delegation, Michelle, we have delegation. You talked about uh, not having an ego. Any Anything else? So as a business owner, I believe those are some, some imperatives being organized, not having an ego um, as a, as a, as an employee or as an, or as a business owner, when you're hiring people, I think you need to screen them properly and, you know, ensuring that they have their own self-discipline because at this point, you know, you can't hold somebody's hand through creating a design. Um, otherwise you might as well just do it yeah. yourself. So self-discipline, strong organizational skills. I believe teamwork is imperative whether you're a solopreneur, a designer working for somebody or a business owner, um, because it is a team through your trades, through your collaboration with your colleagues or your uh, clients directly, that collaboration is important. And even when you're collaborating on the design with your client, you're the one delivering something to exceed their expectations, but you have to be able to hear them and listen to them and, and have that teamwork of understanding that might not be the best solution, but that's what they really, really want or need or must have for their lifestyle and working with them to ensure that you incorporate that. And again, that goes back to no ego too. Mm. Now, Michelle, I know one thing you talk about a lot is this idea of processes. Tell me why is why is this so important and what's your take on processes in a business? So in a, in a previous life, I actually worked in two separate industries. So, you know, I obviously started working when I was eight <laughs> because I'm only like, uh, like 29 now, but for reals, I, of course, of I course. <laughs> and when I got into interior design, I, I kind of fell into it. One of the companies that I had been working for had sold. And I just thought, well, this is, I don't want to sit in a cube for the rest of my life. So what do I want to do? What am I good at? And so interior design came, came to mind and I stuck my toe in it. And here I am a decade or so later, but the process is when I first started my company, I was flailing. I didn't know what order things went into. I didn't know how to explain to my client what was coming next and so forth. And then I looked back at my previous experience and noted that in these two industries where I was working in managing multi-million dollar business units, the, the consistent thing were processes, procedures, documentation, checklists, just everything that was written down basically. And so at that point I just became obsessed and I was like, okay, I'm going to write all of this stuff down and I'm going to repeat it. And what I have found from that is that the level of confidence that it provides to you, because as a business owner, you know exactly how things are going to to play through repeatedly. You can scale your business because you can teach your team exactly how to do what you've created. They They can provide input and expand and make it better. But not only that, the confidence that the clients get from your professionalism and the the way that they know that if you can manage your business like this, that you are going to be a really good steward of not only their budget, but their project and the project management that comes with it. And so I have personally found that once I, once I created these, at first I didn't share them with my clients. I just thought, well, this is just internal. But then it started coming out that this is how I run my business. And the, the, the feedback was so fantastic. And then I could, raise, I could raise my prices. So my fees went up incrementally, but then exponentially once my clients understood that, that this business is legit and it's not just a hobby for, for myself or my team. Um, and, and that the fees associated with it were proven because this is exactly how their project was going to run. And so I, I, that's where my passion came to teach others because there's, there's not a, there's not a single way that of running a project. There's not a standardized fee structure in the interior design industry and nobody talks about it. When I started my business, 
I, I was looking for help. I was looking for somebody to guide me, to lead me, to mentor me. Um, and nobody would share. And so I was just thought that was ridiculous and promised myself that if I ever got it figured out, I would share and just blow the lid off of all of the details that go with it. But I believe processes help a business owner sleep at night. What is the secret to getting staff to actually use the processes? Because it's easy to have a process and have it there on the shelf and no one ever follows it. What's the secret? <laughs> well, one is to let them fail. So when, and that's not fun as a business owner, you, you have to catch them at a certain point so that the client doesn't suffer, but you, you share it with them. And like children, you explain, 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 explain. Like, this is why we do it this way. If you go this way, this is what's going to happen. If you go this way, this is what's going to happen. As a business owner, it takes a lot of investment and time to train, which is why hiring should take a long time because the training takes a long time. But you also have to let your staff go a little bit off the rails to see that you were right. Because as human nature, more often than not, we think, oh, yeah, whatever. I can do it just fine my way. And more often than not, I've already tried that way and figured out that it didn't work. So that again goes back to that delegation and the expectation, but also creating a space that is safe to fail. You know, as long as it doesn't impact the client, but you can fail internally and learn from it and fail forward. And so I think as a business owner, that's difficult, but I believe it's very, very important because once your team learns through their own experience, then they are bought into it. And how would you handle it or what would you recommend that a business owner do if they repeatedly tell their staff, hey, look, we got to follow, this is the process, these are the checklists, but the che- it just doesn't happen. You know, it's it's the hardest part of the business is that if somebody's not following the standards and the processes and the procedures that they were hired to follow and adhere to, then I'm afraid that it's just not a good working relationship. You might be a beautiful person and a beautiful designer, and it's broken my heart, but I've I've, I've had to let people go in, in that respect. And it's never easy. But I think it's necessary because there's more headache with you cleaning up behind them when the when the client's dissatisfaction is continued and your reputation is sullied and so forth. So prior to prior to letting somebody go, however, I believe that if you have to terminate somebody as a business owner, this individual should never be surprised. So you should have operational procedures that lead up to it. Like the first time, maybe, hey, you know what? I'm sorry, but you're actually, yeah, you're getting written up. The second time is you're, you're getting written up and here's you're going to be on a 90-day um, review. And then if, if you don't follow the processes exactly between now and then, you are going to be let go. And so... It's never just going to be like, oh, well, she's not following the rules, so I'm going to fire her. It, it's, it should never be like that. It should be a, a standardized, again, process of termination when it comes down to that. Um, if the individual is surprised that they are terminated, then you as the business owner or as the manager have not done your job, in my opinion. What are the biggest roadblocks that you see the interior designers face when implementing processes in their business? I think the biggest roadblock is time because we're all hustling out there trying to make a living and then trying to make the most beautiful design possible. And then that takes up so much time that working on the business is difficult versus in the business. And then the roadblock of doing so many things instinctually as a designer, you, you, you do a lot of things instinctually, um, but there's the, there's the creative brain and the business brain, and the, they don't always communicate. So the creative brain just wants to go out and make things pretty and make people happy. And then the business side of the brain is like, 
well, that's great, but we can't pay our mortgage. (laughs) So we have to figure this out. And then that's where the internal strife and the anxiety and the sleepless nights and the gray hair come as a business owner. So finding that balance um, is difficult. And there are very, so many creatives that just don't have the ability, just like, you know, a financial advisor, somebody who's very financially driven, financial analyst or whatever, probably doesn't have the ability to, to, to create a beautiful space. And, and that doesn't mean that either one is better. It just means that we have different strengths that lie in different hemispheres of our brain. And how do you, how do you counsel your students to overcome these roadblocks that they come up against? Well, first of all, if they're my students, they've taken the first step by getting help. Um, and I believe that asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Asking for help is just acknowledging that you have a deficiency somewhere or you, you have an opportunity to improve upon something. And so overcoming these roadblocks is one, find somebody who's done it before and see if you can get their assistance leading them down the same path or a similar path. But secondly is also don't follow blindly because all of our minds work a little bit differently. And I tell my students, look, this is exactly how it's worked for me. These are the tools that I've used. This is how I, this is how I use them. But if it doesn't make sense to you completely, one, let's dig into it and I'll explain it. And then you implement it the way that makes sense for you so that you still get the same result, but you might take a different path. So I believe that thinking for ourselves is still very important and stepping back and not taking things personally. So it's difficult to do when the client says or shows some semblance of disappointment because of the deliverable, maybe not the actual design, but the way it was communicated or came in over budget or not on schedule. Don't take that personal. You need to learn from it and I, I, I tell my tell my team, I tell my students, you need to fall forward or fail forward and catch yourself, learn from it, and and then move on and, and don't repeat it. Mm. So, so important. And that kind of ties into the conversation that we're going to have next after this episode of the conversation about mindset. Mm-hmm. So we invite our listeners to tune in next week as we we talk a little bit more maybe about the the soft side of running a business does that sound good michelle I think that sounds really good i'd appreciate that and that's a wrap today's episode is sponsored by smart practices the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture because You see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.